Three extraordinary phenomena. A powder that explodes with one blow. A boat that floats in the air. And extremely powerful supermagnets. We send our reporter Felix von Sassen to find out more about these incredible substances. Our first super substance, lead azide, a harmless looking white powder until... In fact, lead azide is one of the fastest and most powerful explosives. To find out more about this amazing substance, our reporter meets with chemist Dr. Jens Walter. Lead azide, what is it and what does it consist of? And above all, why is it so explosive? We can have a look here. I'd say let's do it ourselves. Good. Right, put the goggles on. Always compulsory in the lab. To make lead azide, Jens only needs two other salts. We won't say which ones, because we don't want to give any instructions for making explosives. Jens dissolves the salts in water. Then he pours the two solutions together and they start to react with each other immediately. What looks like washing powder is the lead azide. Just filter it and then we have a substance with incredible capabilities. Do we have to be careful already? Well, it's still quite wet, not much will happen. As long as it's wet, it's relatively easy to handle. But you should still not touch it with your bare hands, because lead azide is highly toxic. And it is extremely sensitive when dry. Less than a gram is enough. It looks a bit tiny and harmless now, but you think it'll have a big effect? Yeah, there's quite a lot of energy in there. It's small, but wow. Even a light blow is enough for an explosion. But how strong is lead azide compared to well-known explosives? Blaster Wolfgang Stabe now shows us. Everyone knows gunpowder, highly flammable, causes a real bang. But you can already see a difference there. And then, of course, we also have plastic explosives, TNT, and all the other modern explosives, which we'll now use in the same proportion. With 350 grams of each of the three explosives, Wolfgang wants to carry out a so-called comparative blast. To do this, they both bury the explosives in the ground. Based on the size and depth of the craters, Wolfgang and Felix can later compare the explosive power of lead azide in relation to the other two explosives. What do we start with? With the weakest explosive, gunpowder. Okay. One after the other, Wolfgang detonates the three explosive charges. At first glance, there is hardly any difference. Exact information can only be obtained by measuring. The gunpowder? Yes, almost nothing. Diameter of the crater? 40 centimeters. Quite different with a plastic explosive. That looks much more impressive. 1 meter 30. And the lead azide? That's one meter, that is. If you consider that this plastic explosive is one of the strongest explosives in the world, then lead azide has done quite well. But its greatest strength is this. While other explosives change easily and sometimes only have a shelf life of a few months or years, the lead azide is chemically stable for decades. Chemist Jens puts the lead azide in water, alcohol, lye and acid. It does not react with any of them, but most intriguingly, as soon as it is dry again. Three, two, one. Chemically extremely stable and highly explosive in the smallest of quantities. And what is this unique explosive needed for? For airbag detonators, for example. Because they have to function faultlessly even after 20 or 30 years. Using an old steering wheel from the scrapyard, Wolfgang wants to show our reporter how much power an airbag still has even after a very long time, thanks to the lead azide. 
Feuer bereit machen. 3, 2, 1. Wow! Alle Achtung! Really impressive. Even after all these years, it's lost none of its explosive power and can still save lives. Lead Azide. On with our second incredible substance. A boat that can hover. How does it work? It doesn't seem to be the boat. That's just normal aluminium foil. And the aquarium is empty, so it can't be that either. The secret is a gas, sulfur hexafluoride, the heaviest gas in the world. What makes this gas so special and why things can float on it is explained to our reporter by chemist Dr. Jens Walter. We can demonstrate this here now. If the two wires come too close to each other, we get sparks. Yes, and sulfur hexafluoride. That's a gas, it doesn't burn, for example. I'll turn it up. So it doesn't burn. That's why the sparks can't burn very well inside. To demonstrate this, Jens fills the gas into an aquarium. Since it is heavier than air, it stays in the glass tank even without a lid. So let's have a look. And indeed, despite the short circuit, there are no sparks this time. When there's a spark in the air, electrons flow towards each other from the two poles. These electrons have to squeeze their way through the air molecules. The molecules of the gas are much heavier and more inert than those of the air. Consequence, the electrons can't pass between the molecules. No spark can be created. And if it is, it's extinguished by the gas in fractions of a second. This property of sulfur hexafluoride makes it virtually irreplaceable in transformer stations. It is needed there in the so-called circuit breakers. Such a switch works like an overdimensional fuse for voltages of often more than 100,000 volts. And this switch is filled with sulfur hexafluoride. If, for example, the overhead line is damaged, the switch disconnects the contacts and thus the flow of current. The extremely high voltage creates an arc, an extremely strong spark. The sulfur hexafluoride extinguishes it in a fraction of a second, preventing the switch from burning down. And, of course, the enormous density of the gas is also the trick used for our floating ship. As you can see, it floats. The gas is so dense and heavy that the relatively light aluminium boat floats on it as if it were water. You can do a few other cool things with the gas. As I said, it's a very high density and that has a completely different effect when I breathe in the gas. You know my voice, listen to what happens when I breathe this gas in. Right, so I'm going to get a big dose now. Yeah, here we go. And let's see how my voice sounds now. It's a mixture of Darth Vader and Barry Manilow. So, sulfur hexafluoride is a really cool substance. Our third incredible substance has something to do with magnets. Extremely strong magnets, also called supermagnets or death magnets. Why are these magnets so strong? They're not like normal household magnets that you know from home. These magnets are special magnets. They have neodymium in them. Neodymium, iron and boron. These are the main components and they are far more magnetic than a normal ferrite magnet. Neodymium is one of the so-called rare earth metals. It only occurs naturally in minerals, from which it has to be extracted in a complex process. Yes, it looks just like metal shavings. Right, exactly. So now it should... Well, nothing happens at all. Exactly. Neodymium is not magnetic. Sounds strange, but these supermagnets only become magnets through this special processing together with the iron and the boron. Felix meets a magnet manufacturer to see how it works. 
First, a basic material is ground extremely finely in a vacuum together with iron, boron and our neodymium. That takes almost 10 hours. Magnet expert Dietmar Schwegler shows our reporter why the whole process is carried out without any contact to air and why the finished powder must not be exposed to the air afterwards. Now, we have to wait a bit. You see? There, it went up right away. Wow! It oxidizes now, burns, and then the powder is destroyed, of course. So that's just because oxygen got into it. Yeah, that's right. The next step in the process, filling the powder into molds, is therefore also carried out in the absence of air. In a special press and under high pressure of almost 400 bar, the neodymium iron boron powder becomes the raw magnet. And Felix tests it right away. I can tell the keys are attracted a bit, but it's not a super magnet yet. Not by a long way. Before that, the magnets have to go into the oven, be sawn into shape and finally... magnetized. This happens here in an extremely strong electronic magnetic field. This causes the poles in the raw magnet to align in one direction and... Yeah, I'd say this is already a super magnet. They're already magnetized. They are very strong, but not the strongest. Felix now wants to test how strong this strongest magnet is at a scrapyard. A normal magnet of this size holds about 20 kilos. And the super magnet? Yard foreman Sigmar Schuler helps Felix. I've brought my magnet here. Now I want you to lift a few things for me. No problem. Yeah, super. First test. Can the magnet handle the official maximum weight of 85 kilos? And indeed. Yes, so I'm definitely hanging. No more ground contact under my feet. Next up is a 160 kilo steel beam. Can the magnet, which is just 7 centimeters high, really lift it? Yeah, very good. Very good. 160 kilos. No problem for the magnet either. But can the magnet lift even more? The next steel beam weighs a good 200 kilos. Even though this is the end of the line, the neodymium magnet really deserves to be called a super magnet. <laughs>